All right, let's uh, let's get started. So, uh, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening uh, to all of you from whichever part of the world you're joining us from. I can see all of the countries uh, popping up in the chat. It's it's amazing to see uh, such a widespread uh, attendance. I think some of the countries include like Spain, Ukraine, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the United States. Uh, I think the Netherlands, Argentina, Ukraine. Uh, Portugal. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing to see uh, all of you joining from uh, all corners of the world. So, so welcome again and uh, really, really excited uh, to uh, do this webinar, a joint webinar with Trivago. Uh, I will uh, basically, where we'll basically get an inside look at uh, how Trivago <clears throat> finds the balance in their end-to-end -end testing strategy. So, thank you all for uh, taking the time to attend. So before we begin, just a few uh, minor housekeeping, housekeeping pointers. So this webinar will run for uh, exactly an hour. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, Benjamin present uh, and, and walk through uh, Trivago's end-to-end -end testing strategy for about 40 to 45 minutes. And uh, we will reserve 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions. Uh, the, the webinar is being recorded and uh, the recording will be shared with, with all of you through our YouTube channel. Uh, there is a Q&A button uh, in the Zoom interface. Uh, so I encourage all of you to take the time uh, throughout the talk uh, to pop in your questions through the Q&A uh, button. And uh, we will do our best to address all of them uh, you know, at the end uh, when we save about 15 minutes for, for Q&A. Great, uh, I think with, uh, with that um, out of the way, uh, let me sort of uh, you know, talk about a uh, little bit about browser stack and give you a quick intro about uh, browser stack and then uh, we can dive into the web. So uh, browser stack was started nine years ago uh, by our co-founders Ritesh and Nakul. Uh, working literally out of a coffee shop, uh, Ritesh and Nakul launched browser stack to solve a problem that they kept encountering as uh, developers. Uh, you know, they had, they had built a website for uh, one of their startups and uh, you know, they spent more time trying to test their website uh, than they did uh, building their website. And uh, you know they, that's sort of the problem, uh, you know, which led them to this insight of, of building test infrastructure and, and allowing developers around the world to test on different browsers and devices. And uh, that's how they launched. And uh, the first version of Browse Stack allowed users to test on one browser, uh, which was Internet Explorer. Uh, and that was back in the day when IE was still, you know, uh, the market leader when it came to browser market share. Uh, within six months, uh, Browse Stack had a thousand paying customers, and uh, now nine years later, we have four offices across San Francisco, New York, Mumbai, and Dublin, and uh, we have over 600 employees now. Uh, we've got over 25,000 customers uh, who trust us for their testing. Uh, this includes uh, leaders like Trivago, obviously, who's uh, you know uh, Benjamin is joining us from Trivago today. Then we've got uh, you know uh, teams from Microsoft, Twitter, Spotify, Verizon, ESPN. Uh, Warner Media, RBS, Barclays, Mastercard, Expedia, and and many more. Uh, with the trust of these customers, we've become the de facto testing platform for enterprises. Um, open source technologies that power the internet are tested on browser stack. Uh, over five years ago, we partnered with jQuery to make the internet more compatible. Uh, since then, we've worked with numerous open source projects to make innovation accessible and uh, make the internet more compatible. Um, our platform of uh, 2000 plus browsers and devices uh, supports a massive scale of testing. So we have over 2 million registered users on our platform uh, who run 72 billion Selenium commands every year. Uh, we've got customers from over 135 countries who run their tests on 15 globally distributed data centers around 12 different locations. Uh, the world's largest cloud providers rely on browse stack for their testing. Uh, this includes the world's best retailer, the world's best search engine, the world's best database provider, and the world's best enterprise company. All of them pick browser stack to run their tests. I'm going to talk a little bit about the products uh, that we offer. So uh, starting with uh, the products that we have for web testing. Uh, so for uh, testing your websites across the 2000 plus browsers and devices, we have live. Uh, live is used uh, basically for interactive and manual testing uh, where uh, developers and QAs uh, run some of their smoke tests and uh, you know, check and try to replicate bugs uh, on the 2000 plus browsers and devices that we have. Um, Automate uh, is our Selenium, uh, Selenium grid on the cloud. Uh, it's the most reliable automated testing platform on the market. And uh, you can run your Selenium tests at a, with a massive level of parallelization on our uh, high performance grid for quick deterministic feedback. <clears throat> uh, we have our latest entrant, which is Percy. Uh, so we acquired Percy and uh, announced, uh, uh, integrated and announced Percy uh, on our platform in July this year. 
And uh, Percy enables you to deliver pixel perfect UI with visual testing, right? So with Percy, you can integrate uh, into your existing CI CD pipeline and review visual changes with every commit. Uh, on the mobile app uh, testing side, uh, we have uh, App Live, uh, which allows you to do manual testing for your uh, native and hybrid um, iOS and Android apps. Uh, and we have App Automate, which allows you to run your automated app tests uh, on native and hybrid uh, iOS and Android apps, right? Again, on the 200 plus browsers and devices that we have on our platform. Uh, with App Automate, you can use a variety of frameworks. So we support Appium, Espresso, XUI test, and Earl Grey. Uh, we also have a bunch of free tools uh, that uh, we, we make available to, to all of our users and to, to anybody really. So uh, with, uh, with screenshots, you can uh, basically test uh, the cross browser compatibility of a uh, website uh, across different uh, sort of uh, screen sizes and on different devices to see how your website actually looks. Uh, you have responsive, which tells, uh, you know, sort of helps you understand, uh, you know, across different breakpoints, how responsive your website is, uh, again, on the different uh, real iOS and Android devices we have. And our latest entrant uh, is SpeedLab, which allows you to test your uh, speed, uh, the, you know, the performance of your website across real browsers and devices. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Benjamin Bischoff. Uh, Benjamin is a test automation engineer at uh, Trivago. Uh, he's been uh, in game and application development uh, for 15 plus years and uh, you know he's decided to sort of you know he made a decision to switch to test automation and make that uh, his career um he's got uh, you know uh, he's, he's the author of two two open source projects for cucumber, cucumber bdd parallel text execution and reporting and he's also sort of a frequent uh, speaker and contributor to different events and uh, he's also got his own website so uh, yeah th th thanks a lot again for uh, joining everyone and thank you benjamin uh, for uh, giving us uh, you know uh, the insights into into trivago and its end to end uh, testing strategy uh, with that i will hand uh, hand it over to benjamin over to you benjamin thanks a lot so let me share my screen here I hope you can see the slide at the moment. Yep. All right, cool. So welcome again. Good morning, good night, good day, wherever you are. It's really amazing how many of you are there from all over the world. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about Trivago's end-to-end -end test strategy. Uh, and I called it finding the balance because it's crucial to keep the balance between all the different parts of your test strategy. So the agenda is to talk a little bit about me, but very quickly about Trivago, about how this presentation came along. Then the main part will be our test strategy history, the current state of the test strategy and the key concepts and key learnings. So that's me. A lot of this has been mentioned already. I'm a test automation engineer and subject matter expert for test automation at Trivago. I've been here for about five years now, uh, six years of test automation experience. And before that, I used to be a full-time developer, mainly Java Enterprise and Java Core. And I decided after getting in touch with test automation and especially Selenium to make this my main career. And yeah, I'm not such a frequent speaker. I'm more of an occasional speaker. Uh, so I'm very glad that I can speak now. So a little bit about Trivago. Trivago was founded in 2005. It's located in Düsseldorf, Germany. Um, where its headquarter is. In fact, I'm broadcasting right now from the headquarter. And it was the first German hotel meta search. So what it offers is that you can enter any destination, hotel, point of interest, whatever you're interested in, a filter for specific amenities of an hotel or uh, accommodation, and then Trivago forwards this request to various online travel agencies, independent hotels or hotel chains, and shows you your ideal hotel. 
We have about uh, 3 million hotels and alternative accommodations uh, searched through more than 250 booking sites. We are active in more than 190 countries on 54 platforms. Um, I think this is still rather accurate. That is 33 languages and we have more than 100 filters you can apply to your search. This you might have seen before. This is our main website where you can perform all those searches and get hotel and accommodation recommendations. And this is in constant development, all of the different parts of it. So that makes it a real challenge to test also the multi-language uh, support. In case you're interested, just scan the QR code and it takes you directly to the German instance of the website. About this presentation, um, I went through five years of JIRA tasks of confluence documents of uh, exchange calendar entries and try to put together timelines of test automation at Trivago. This is how it looks. I will not go through all of this. Don't worry, that would be super boring. And this is already the condensed version of it. But instead, I picked out certain events and certain things we changed um, that are worth talking about. Little disclaimer here, take all I say with a grain of salt. This is something that worked for us that might not be something that works for you. I will only talk about end-to-end -end testing here. In fact, we have a lot more tests running like API tests and integration and component and unit tests, but this would be way out of scope for today. And it's more about the process. I will not talk so much about technology. I'm sorry, might do that next time. But with this out of the way, let's dive into developing a test strategy. Um, I ordered this by years and to make it less boring, I uh, tried to find a movie, a top grossing movie for every year. And after I've seen how many Marvel movies came out, I tried to find the top Marvel movie for each year that came out. So if you want, you can play along and try to guess what movie will be next. So 2016, that's when Civil War, the first Avenger came out. That's the year I started at Trivago. And that's the year we came in touch with touchstones. I call them touchstones. Um, a touchstone is a test or criterion for the qualities of a thing. And I use this as questions you can ask to advance. I will show you what that means. So a touchstone for uh, test automation and your test strategy could be which technologies should we use. But for me, this is not so much a question of technology. It's more about which problems do we need to solve. If you ask this question, you get a lot of insight already in what you have to do next. Um, this is our legacy process that existed uh, when I started. So there was new feature developments. Uh, alongside of this was a lot of exploratory testing that some people call manual testing. I don't really like calling it this. Um, then all those features were merged. Then there was some kind of automated testing, which was very spread out across different people and machines and nobody really know what was going on. And uh, every two weeks there was a release if everything worked out. There are problems with this approach. You have a lot of repetitive manual work. Old features could break easily because if you just test a new feature and leave out the old features at that point, you might have a bad surprise in the end. The release cycles are really long. I mean, in worst case, a developer would have to wait more than two weeks until his changes were actually live. There were 
uh, also some rollbacks because everything was merged prior to release. So that means that a lot of features could break each other. And in general, testing was done too late. The process itself also had problems because we didn't have clear test ownership. We didn't have things like a clear test location that everyone could just look at and find all the tests. We didn't have any code styling applied to test code. So we didn't treat it really as proper code. There was no real visibility of test results and the test coverage and we were just lacking defined processes for things like, what do we do if a test fails? So we defined a target process that we wanted to have. So alongside the feature development, there should already be automated testing. I deliberately put the automated in parentheses because I don't really make that much of a distinction between automated and exploration or, or exploratory testing. For me, it's just the same. Automation for me is uh, just a tool that enables better exploration. So I will just call it testing. During the merge, there should be further testing because this is another point that everything could break. If that passes, we should be able to release whenever we want. And of course, this should as well be followed up by testing. Additional to that, we wanted to have live testing against live instances. We wanted to have uh, an insight into flakiness of tests and environments. And we also wanted to be able to test the variations of the website and certain components. So that's a lot. I mean, you cannot just solve everything at the same time. So the most important question we asked was, what is the most important issue to tackle? What is the low hanging fruit? What is the thing that we can solve now and leave the rest for later? And for us, that was structure and visibility. Um, when I joined Trivago there, was an automation team that was just formed. And that team had certain tasks they should do to reach this uh, target process. We were supposed to develop the test framework and pipelines, support all teams using our test platforms, remove repetitive work, and in general, improve the stability of our web application. We were empowered to do this, uh, this process uh, by making decisions. We said we want to empower QA to write and own the end-to-end -end tests because they have the big picture. They know how everything is connected. They are the best people to write the end-to-end -end tests. Also, they are the ones that benefit from this directly because it frees up space for their exploration. We defined clear test guidelines. So where should the test be located? How should naming be? And things like that. And we said that the test code is located in the repository of the software under test. So that means when everyone checks out the code for the software under test, they immediately have the test code available and can also run the test locally. And for our CI and CD systems, we centralized the test run within pipelines. So the main focus for us for running the test was within those pipelines and not locally. We also had some additional accomplishments. Um, we released the first version of our own in-house test framework because our old framework was an open source one that didn't work too well in our use case. So this was uh, an achievement. 
we started automation time meetings. That's what we called them. Those were regular meetings with the uh, QA team and test automation team to just talk about test automation, to have workshops together and to um, teach and get feedback. We set up test qualification. Um, this is a process where each new test is run 100 times in a row to get feedback about how flaky it is. And if it passes those 100 runs, it is less likely to be flaky in the future. And we also started supporting Selenium Hub for the future because up until then, it was just running in sequence in one single browser, like basically like browser stack started. So the next year, 2017, when Guardians of the Galaxy, one of my favorite Marvel movies came out, the main takeaways from last year were clearer test processes, better test organization, and we finally had the test ownership by QA. However, there were some problems now because everyone was empowered to write tests. We quickly had too many tests at that point. So our test runtime exceeded 45 minutes, which is way too long for proper feedback. Also, um, the test reports we, we received back from the test runs were rather confusing. So there were other questions we needed to ask at that point. How fast does the test feedback need to be? to be actually helpful for QA and developers, because it's not really helpful if a developer pushes some code and gets results an hour later. How clear does the test feedback need to be? The clearer the feedback is that you get from the test, the easier it is to work with it and find out what actually failed. So our main issues in this year were speed and clarity. And the speed can be just narrowed down to parallel execution, which we didn't have at that point. Everything was running in sequence. That's one reason why everything took so long. So we had to find a solution for that. And that's all, always a good question to ask. Is there a sufficient solution available already? In our case, there wasn't not for the parallel execution. There were some libraries out there that enabled the parallel execution of our tests, which are all Cucumber based. But at that point in time, there was none that really fit our needs. So during a company-wide hackathon, I came up with the parallel plugin called Cucable that slices um, test scenarios into the smallest possible chunks that can be parallelized. Again, if you scan this QR code, you will be taken to the GitHub page of it because it's all open source now. Also, you need a test grid to run those parallel tests. So we did a major test grid evaluation at that point and asked questions like, what technical resources do we actually need? And what is the required maintenance time and frequency of those uh, test grids? Because we didn't want to spend a lot of time maintaining a test grid. And uh, this would also cost a lot of money to do this. Yeah, how big is the financial investment? Not only about the maintenance, but also about the initial cost. And Last but not least, how fast is the execution time? Because if the test grid performs poorly, you don't really get that much benefit from parallel execution. So we evaluated a lot of different grids. And in the end, as you know, we said, yeah, browser stack is it, because it ticked all of the boxes for us. So the only thing we had to solve now was the clarity of our reporting. And again, the first question we always ask is, 
is there a sufficient solution available already? And frankly, there wasn't. I mean, this was the report that we were using at that time, and you might know it if you use Cucumber because it's rather widely used. But for us, this had some problems. So don't get me wrong, I don't want to downplay this reporting library. I just want to point out what I think is wrong with it. It just shows too much data and it just shows too much unneeded data. You have a lot of colors here, you have a lot of numbers here, but essentially the only thing you're interested here in the report is how many scenarios failed and why. So one company-wide hackathon later, I came up with the uh, Cluecumber reporting plugin for Cucumber. I know the names are, <laughs> are maybe not the best, but that's how it's called. Um, again, you can follow the QR code to get taken to the GitHub page because this as well as uh, Cucumber is open source and actually Trivago and empowers open source and supports it. And I'm really grateful for that. So here in this new report, you immediately say, uh, see that nine scenarios failed. You can click on each scenario and find out exactly why they failed. They have the screenshots and the videos and all the steps and stack traces. So this helped a lot. Additionally to that, we um, set up a flakiness detection job that runs during the night and generates a lot of data that is presented in a dashboard the next morning. And each morning, one of our QA team is looking at that dashboard and then pinging the uh, owners of the respective tests to follow up on the flakiness. We also have synthetic monitoring, which could be a presentation of its own, because this is a core scenario that we run against some of our live instances in a loop. We use that as an additional form of monitoring. And uh, usually, it's faster and more accurate than any of the other monitoring we're running. Also, in terms of meetings, we started the QA guild internally and also a meeting, an, an additional one to the other automation and QA meeting where we just shared what we all had done during the week. And we were blocking pull requests. So our <laughs> automated tests were actually acting like an additional reviewer that blocked the pull request if anything failed. Well, actually, only kind of, because most of the time, this just hindered developers and QA. Because if those tests are flaky, and it doesn't have to mean that those tests themselves are flaky, because it could just mean that the environment is flaky or a connection to a specific service is flaky, then those tests fail and block everything. So at that point, the developers don't trust the tests, QA don't trust the tests anymore, and it's just annoying. So we took that out again. But this is something you have to go through when finding your ideal test strategy. Those things, you have to just try out those things, see them fail, learn from them, and then do differently. Oh, wow, we're already in 2018 when Avengers Infinity War came out. Another nice Marvel movie. So the main takeaways from the last year were faster and more stable test runs, clearer processes, and way more meaningful test reports. But there was another problem. Do we have enough resources for our test runs? 
I mean, we were running way more tests now. We were running them in parallel, but running in parallel occupies more test resources. They're, they don't run as long, but still they occupy a lot of sessions. So the resources we needed were actually more test sessions. So what we did there is uh, experiment with an on-demand grid that is uh, basically spun up when the test run is starting. And then it uh, just destroys itself when the test run is stopped. So this way we were able to use all the browser stack sessions we needed, but have a little bit of free space for additional testing. But technical problems were not our main issue at that point. Understanding the why was our main issue. And I mentioned that in the last presentation during the Breakpoint conference already, we had this triangle we have the QA team, the development team, and the test automation team. So three separate teams. QA team and developers got along pretty well already. But the test automation team was detached from the developers. So we were never really in contact. Also the QA team and the test automation team didn't really have a direct connection because we, we, as the test automation team, were so tech-driven that we lost focus of our users, the QA folks. This led to what I like to call the triangle of doom. So you see the test automation team is just detached from everything. So we were in this kind of ivory tower dictating QA team to do test automation and developers to do test automation without really stressing why we're doing it. So there was a simple solution, but also a pretty hard solution, in my opinion, because I didn't really like it at that time, integrating the test automation team into QA. By doing that, QA and test automation were one. That means that each, each site really started understanding the why much better. We were closer to each other. Test automation was closer to the customers. Um, we could learn from each other about the application. The developers took us way more seriously because we were part of a well-established team. So this solved everything. And uh, it's still like this. And this was, I think, the best change that was introduced. Because everyone needs to be on the same page. And testing is a team effort. Um, there are some companies that say a QA team is uh, the team that should ensure quality, as the name implies. But for me, everyone should ensure quality. The developers, the stakeholders, product managers, everyone ensures quality. And because we were closer together in this uh, integration, we started to ask how expressive are the tests that we have? And are we testing the same things multiple times? Because this is also something, if you test the same thing multiple times that um, blocks the test resources, that um, makes the whole testing process much slower, the feedback times longer. And also this, how could our tests run earlier? And can we shift tests to a lower test pyramid layer? I think many of you know the test pyramid, but we didn't have a pyramid at that time. 
we had what we call a testing hourglass. We had a lot of end, end tests because that's what we were all familiar with. And we had way less integration and component tests and a lot of unit tests because the developers were doing a lot of unit tests already. But we wanted to have this. We wanted to have less end-to-end -end tests and shift the tests that all the tests that we could down the pyramid because the further down they run, the earlier in the development process they run and also the faster they are. If you compare the runtime of unit tests with the runtime of end-to-end -end tests and also the resources needed for unit tests and end-to-end -end tests, you will get the point. I mean, unit tests are way faster and way cheaper to run than end-to-end -end tests. So at that point, we did a complete test review and tried to separate the tests that tested the same thing, got rid of them, consolidated tests. Um, so we reduced the overall number without sacrificing coverage. In terms of the framework itself, we introduced a plugin API so we could also maintain the test framework and the test technology much, much better. And the first thing we uh, developed as a plugin for our test framework was a retry plugin. I know there's, there's controversy about retrying tests, but for us, this was really a game changer because before that, if a test failed because of a flaky connection to a service or some data center issues, there was uh, a failing test. Even though the test itself was okay. So in those cases, and only in those cases, we rerun the tests and if they, uh, if they are successful the second time they run, we consider them successful. Also, we split the tests that we already had in a core and an extended suite. So the core tests is uh, a small number of tests that are absolutely vital for our application and the users of our application. And the extended tests, which are way, way more, they test very specific features of the website that not everybody uses. But things that generate money and revenue for us are absolutely vital, like uh, being able to select a hotel. Two thousand nineteen. Spider Man: Far From Home. I wonder who of you would have guessed this. So the main takeaways from the last year were, were that the test automation team was now inside QA. The test framework architecture was much improved and the tests and the test runs themselves were revised. So at that point, when we had a very reliable test automation, we started to question the configurations our tests ran on. And with configurations, I mean the devices, the browsers, because at that time we were only running on desktop browsers, mainly Chrome, but things like BrowserStack's device penetration charts that are linked here, and also our own uh, business intelligence data told us another story because most of our users are on mobile devices. So at that point, we wanted to rewrite and review our tests so they were compatible on mobile devices. But not only that, the same question arose as before, do we have enough resources for our test runs? So we did another evaluation of test grids. Uh, we chose BrowserStack again 
not only because we were already using it and very familiar with it, but because it won our second evaluation as well. Additionally, we started building our in-house test grid to free up even more sessions and keep the important tests on the browser stack sessions. Additionally, we um, had lock assertion support in our tests. That is also something that could be kind of controversial because we wanted to have a way to test the data um, the website and the web applications is generating in the backend. So when you do certain kinds of user interactions, we wanted to check if the data that was generated was valid. So that was actually a pretty big prop, uh, pretty big thing we implemented, but in the end, that was very beneficial for us. Again, it might not be a way to go for you. Also for QA, we introduced a universal test pipeline. So a pipeline that is not attached to a specific um, CI pipeline, but you can use it to run tests wherever you want, however you want. You can say, I want to run this test scenario on those two mobile devices or do any, um, anything that QA might need in their day-to-day -day work that is not inside a specific other pipeline. And we simplified the test run for CI and CD by using Docker containers and make files. Again, this is a topic that I could talk about for hours, but I just want to mention it here as an additional accomplishment because it's not really related to our test strategy. For 2020, can you guess? No Marvel movie. So the best thing I found was this one, Trolls. Yeah, I know. Let's take this away. The main takeaways from last year were mobile testing, Streamlight test runs, and also the introduction of the internal test grid. How expressive are our tests? We needed to ask then, because we had ways to test on mobile devices, we also wanted to have additional tests that are only targeted at mobile devices. So we wrote new mobile exclusive tests and also, which is a very important point, added mobile flakiness detection. You remember that was the job that runs during the night and gives us data about the flakiness the next day. This was only used on desktop at that time. So now we already uh, also have that for mobile. Another game changer here was making the extended tests completely optional. So QA can decide when to run them or not to run them at all. If the feature or the code that was introduced is completely unlikely to break anything in the extended suite. This frees up test resources as well and makes the feedback much, much faster and you need a certain level of trust to have this in place to make something like this optional. Yeah, we have some future tasks at hand. We want to use our framework in new web applications. There are a number of applications in development right now that unfortunately I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, we have to adapt our test runs to a different CI CD technology. So this is in the process of being switched. Again, I'm sorry, I cannot disclose what we're using. Adapting to releases in the cloud because a lot of our applications are now running in cloud infrastructures and also implementing additional testing technologies apart from our own framework, 
we will use things like Cypress for development. And that's something we are currently on the lookout for. So the current state, if you remember, oh, I'm sorry. That was the legacy process. We wanted to have the target process with testing in each stage and also life testing, flakiness handling, and testing of variations. And we reached all that during the years. An important factor in this is the responsibilities of QA because they are still the ones that define the test cases and implement the test cases, review and approve all of the test code, review the test results that come in each day, ensure the application testability, and most importantly, QA does the releases because they know when the application is in a ready state that can be released. So the improvements that we now have through all this are stable features, fast feedback, and quick releases. Uh, right now we can release multiple times a day and we will improve upon that even more so we can release instantly when a change is coming in. Um, let me mention some key concepts that we applied to finding our test uh, strategy. One is Kaizen, that is Japanese uh, and means improvement. But in the English translation, the continually was added. So it is now the practice of continually seeking improvement. That's exactly what I meant. Just pick the right things to do at that point in time that you can do now and can act as a base for further improvements later. Also the KISS principle, which is typically um, associated with software development means keep it simple, stupid. That's the idea that products should be as simple as possible. That doesn't mean that the code should be as simple as possible, but it should be usable and it should be easy to understand. And that's what we try to apply to our testing as well. And my favorite principle is YACNI, which stands for you aren't gonna need it. A programmer should not add functionality until deemed necessary. So that means in our test infrastructure, in our test code, we don't say, oh, this feature is likely to appear sometimes. No, we don't do that. We wait until we really need this and then we implement it. That is a huge time saver. It keeps the test application stable and it's just overall a good idea to be focused. The key learnings here, let me just browse through them quickly. Test automation is not the end. If you have test automation in place, it's not done. It's just a base for further improvement. Test automation is a tool and that's a tool for exploration. It enables you to explore further and gives you triggers in which direction to explore. Test automation is a product. So the test code, the pipeline code, the framework code, everything should be a product and should be treated as such with the same care and the same love as the application code. Don't be afraid to question things because if you don't question things, you don't get answers that lead into improved functionality. Listen to your users. That's something that typically product managers do, but 
uh, as a provider of test automation pipelines and software, we have to listen to QA as well, because they are the ones that have to make sense of the test results. Never stop learning, that's a given. Uh, frankly, in the five years I, I have been here, there was not one day I haven't learned a new thing. And I'm really thankful for this. And that's the big one. Communication is key. So with this, I say thank you. If you want to reach me on Twitter, my handle is Bishop Def. And the website that was mentioned before is softwaretester.blog. Thanks a lot. Now I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Benjamin. It was a really, really interesting journey. It was great to see uh, over the last four to five years how, how Trivago has sort of you know, gone through this journey of, of, of testing. Um, and, I, and I love the, uh, the Avengers plugs, plugins. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't pick uh, Endgame as one of the choices. <laughs> that was one of my favorite movies. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> For next time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, okay, great. Um, I think, uh, 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 Benjamin, if you want to just maybe stop sharing for a second, let me just share my oh, screen. Yes. Sure, of Thank course. You. Great. So, uh, folks, we'll get into questions. Uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, we have another webinar coming up in just about a month, uh, hosted by David Burns, who's our, uh, uh, you know, who's leading our open source engineering team, and he's also the core committer for Selenium. So he's going to be talking about, uh, you know, what what Benjamin described as exploratory testing, right, uh, and and how that fits into your QA strategy. Uh, that's coming up on the 8th of December. So uh, please do check out the URL, which uh, the team will, will post in the chat. Uh, another quick announcement is that uh, we are uh, going to be uh, uh, giving away our uh, sort of uh, browse tag pack, uh, right? So the URL will be shared again in the chat. Uh, it gives you, uh, you know, several months access to uh, all of our products uh, on our platform. So you can uh, go ahead and uh, try out all the different browser stack products uh, for free. Awesome. So with that, uh, I'm going to start looking at some of the questions let's see we have a lot of questions uh benjamin so let's let's hope that uh we can cover them all all right all 79 <laughs> yeah well not not uh, possible but uh, let's let's see all right so um okay i think one question is how do you measure end-to-end -end test coverage the coverage yeah how do you measure the uh, or what is your approach to measuring the the amount of coverage you have um, that is a really tricky one because uh, unlike unit testing, it's really hard to measure the coverage. Um, we typically get together um, with the whole team and the QA team and talk about the tests we have and also monitor, of course, uh, every time a new feature is announced and new code is coming in, what will happen in the future. Um, so because QA has the big, big picture and um, they know a lot about what's going on and what features are connected with others, they have a very good idea of how much coverage we have. But it's really, really hard to put that in, into numbers. We have documents about this. We have charts about this. But we don't have a simple way to just say, OK, we are 50% covered. Got it, got it. Okay, uh, I think some questions around uh, maybe sort of your, uh, your, your team structure. Uh, so one is, uh, you know, how large at, at Trivago, how large the development and, and QA teams uh, respectively. And also when you talk about, you know, you talked about test ownership, uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Okay, so um, the core QA team is about 20 people. And I, if I'm not mistaken, we have about 200 developers. Um, so it's, yeah, it's about one to 10. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the test ownership, I mean, um, 
before we started with this whole uh, restructuring of the tests, the tests were just scattered around everywhere. I mean, some teams had some form of automation uh, with a different technology and um, they were run at different times and nobody knew when <laughs> when something was running and what the data meant. So the test ownership for us is just to have a centralized place where we can look and um, especially when something fails that we know who needs to be contacted. And that is uh, the reason why so much is uh, in QA at Trivago, because again, uh, they just know uh, what to delegate to whom. And uh, in terms of the end-to-end -end test, the ownership just means that QA is empowered to write their own test scenarios and to define their own test scenarios. Um, of course, sometimes together with the developers, but that's where all the automated testing is concentrated in inside QA. Got it. Awesome. Okay, I think uh, Benjamin, there were a lot of questions around uh, your flakiness detection, right? Uh, where you mm -hmm. talked about uh, just measuring how flaky your test suites are or your tests are. So number one uh, is how would you define, like what was your criteria for defining a test as flaky? And uh, maybe you could share a little bit more detail about, you know, your, your sort of the, the jobs or, or how you sort of set up your flakiness detection process uh, that runs every night. Okay, so for us, a test is flaky when it passes and fails uh, sometimes, regardless of the state of the dependencies. So if there is a, a missing connection to a web service or there is some uh, problem in a data center, then of course a test may fail. But mm -hmm. if everything is correct and the test still fails randomly, that is surely flaky. And those have to be dealt with. So what we do is uh, during the night, we run the whole test suite continually um, up to uh, 100 times at the moment. So it takes the whole night. And uh, in the morning, we have a special dashboard that shows which tests failed, how many times they failed, and all the reasons. So then we can really see, um, OK, this failed, even though everything was correct. So those tests are isolated and um, skipped and um, dealt with separately. So it's like a small quarantine. Got it, got it. Great, okay. Uh, then there were a few questions around, uh, you know, you, you talked about sort of the uh, pyramid or the triangle of doom, I think, right? Uh, where you talked about the different teams involved, development, QA and test automation. Uh, yeah. So a few questions around that, like, uh, you know, if the test automation team was not actually part of the QA team, right, then who decided uh, and how, what exactly, let's say, to automate? Um, and uh, and then, you know, I think the, the, the sort of the follow on question is, why did you merge the test automation team with QA rather than, let's say, the dev team uh, with, with QA? Uh, okay. so. Um we were very tech driven. I mean, we had management support to introduce test automation in Trivago. Um, so we, we approached it because we were all developers basically from a very technical standpoint and focused on the pipelines and the test framework. But we didn't really talk with QA and the developers of what they really needed to be tested. So that was a detachment from the start. We approached this in a kind of a wrong way. Um, it's, yeah, how, how should I say this? Um, we empowered QA to write tests, but what we completely missed out on is tell them why they should. So for them, it just felt like, okay, they want to turn us into developers now, what, what's going on? 
So it didn't really make sense. So we were both getting more and more frustrated with the situation because we thought, okay, they don't want to do it. And they said, yeah, why should we do it? Nobody is really explaining what this means. So um, in the end, test automation was merged with QA to just um, have a centralized um, team for exploration, no matter if it's done via test automation or manual, as you, as you can say, just have a centralized approach. And of course, we are in contact with developers as well. But this new setup enables us to communicate on a completely different level than before, because QA was communicating with dev uh, way before. So now we can too, and we can profit from each other's knowledge way, way better. Got it. Awesome. Well, okay, the questions keep coming, uh, <laughs> uh, Benjamin, but I think we're, we're out of time. Uh, so I think. Uh, uh, folks, uh, my you know our apologies for not being able to address all of your questions. Uh, we will try to take these offline and uh, see if we can uh, publish some of the answers uh, on the browse tag blog. Uh, again, the the session is recorded, so uh, you know we will be publishing that on our YouTube channel uh, shortly. And uh, you know uh, all of those who were not able to attend or or were only able to attend a part of this, uh, please please feel free to go and uh, check that out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think. Uh, the team will paste the link again for our browse tag pack. So one month access to all of our products and uh, don't forget the upcoming webinar next month. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Benjamin. I think it was a really good, uh, really good presentation. Uh, I think the number of questions is a, is a great indicator of the amount of engagement. Uh, I think you evoked a lot of curiosity and uh, you know, I think just helped a lot of people out. So uh, really thank you for taking the time to put this together and, and walk us through uh, your strategy at, at uh, Tripago. Thanks a lot to everyone listening and thanks again to the browser stack team. You were uh, a big help in putting this together.